Greatly appreciated. So we'll call this meeting to order. Um, it's 9.33. Welcome everyone to our May Safe Communities meeting, our leadership table meeting. Welcome to all of our newcomers. It's nice to have some new faces and some new initials that I see going along the bottom of my screen. So for those that don't know me, I'm Angel Eibel. I am one of the co-chairs of the Safe Communities Leadership Table. I am also the chair for Minto Safe Communities. And my co-chair is Pasquale. And then yes, Christine hello. is our organization. Um, everyone got the minutes along with our agenda. Are there error, any errors or omissions with the minutes? If so, raise your hand. Sarah? I can't hear you, though you're off mute. <laughs> no, I can't hear you yet. Okay, now? Yes. <laughs> it's a miracle. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was actually just putting together an email for Christine just to uh, for just a couple quick changes um, in the Crime Stoppers portion. Um, the first thing was that uh, under point uh, four, uh, Crime Stoppers confirms that tips have been solved in Guelph, Wellington, not tipsters, because we don't want tipsters to confirm that they've just to make that distinction there. Um, and then point uh, 11, the the items uh, recovered are the property of the County of Wellington. I wouldn't want uh, the county to think that we had misdirected the ownership there of items that are recovered. So it's not OPP that owns or that takes possession of them. They manage them, but they go, it reverts back to the County of Wellington, just to be clear on that. And if you don't mind, just Crime Stoppers, two words with a capital S, and it's all good to go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the technical <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Christine will make those notes and changes. Any other errors or omissions? Can I get, oh, Kathy? I think that's who I yes. see. Yes, yes, okay. that's me. Um, just at the beginning of the notes, uh, uh, item two, approval of the minutes. It was moved by Don Schnake and seconded by, is that supposed to be my name? Um, hold on, let me check. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all good. Um, I think it's supposed to be your name. Yep. So we'll just need to take that K out. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> we need, okay, yeah, we'll just correct the spelling of your name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wasn't sure. I thought, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Any other errors or omissions? All right, seeing none, can I get a motion to accept? If you want to virtually raise your hand. Kathy and Jensen seconds. Perfect. Any opposed? Raise your hand. All right, seeing none, I'll call approval of the minutes for our March meeting. Moving on, we have presentations. So our first presentation is Jensen with our Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis. So Jensen, you'll have about 10 minutes to present and then we'll allow about 10 minutes for questions. And again, if you have questions, please just raise your hand virtually and I will go in order. And then I will lower your hand as we call your name. So the floor is yours, Jensen. 
Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks uh, very much for having me to present this morning. I'm just going to share my screen and put up some slides. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it out of my notes here. Bear with me. A year in and technology still baffles me. <laughs> okay, let's see if this works. There we go. Can I just get a thumbs up that folks can see that okay? Perfect. Um, so my name is Jensen. I use she and they pronouns and I work as the public educator at Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis. Uh, before I begin, I'll just give a really quick land acknowledgement if that's okay, uh, to just take the opportunity uh, to have a moment in recognizing and respecting and honoring the land that we're all currently joining from. Uh, I am currently located in Guelph, which is part, uh, which is the traditional Anishinaabe people's territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation and is part of the 1972 uh, Treaty be between the Lakes Treaty, which is Treaty Number Three, and also part of the Haldeman Treaties. So I'll go through relatively quickly, but if you do have questions at the end, please feel free to ask them. So this is just kind of a visual to show uh, where we're located, but for those who haven't heard of Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis before, we're a feminist community-based not-for-profit organization that provides free and confidential services to those who've experienced sexual violence, domestic violence, or human trafficking. Uh, our main administrative office is located in Guelph on Elizabeth Street. Uh, we have Marianne's Place, which is our emergency shelter, which also houses our 24-hour crisis line. And our Rural Women's Support Program serves Wellington County and has four offices located in Erin, Fergus, Mount Forest, and Palmerston. But they serve uh, all of Wellington County. This is just where we have physical space. And I'll get more into what all of those programs are in just a second. In terms of the way that COVID has impacted our services, uh, we are rotating uh, being in the office. So there are folks in our offices for the most of the time. Uh, our in-person counseling is limited to those who are relatively high risk, essentially for the only, the only way that individuals could see us is in person. We've been making exceptions for that. Uh, and our shelter, Marianne's Place, has been operating at half capacity. Uh, and as a shelter, we typically are always operating at full capacity, even pre-COVID. So it's been a little challenging for us, but we've been getting by. And our public education program has been happening, much like everything else, uh, virtually in terms of our workshops and presentations. So I'll start by talking about Mary Ann's Place, which is our emergency shelter. Uh, it's for those who identify as women and for their children who are leaving intimate partner violence or human trafficking within three months. Uh, and really what that provides is a safe space for those where home is not a safe space. And in addition to safe housing, it also provides connections to counseling and other program areas of the agency, um, as well as accompaniment, advocacy, and one-on-one -on -one support. Our transitional and housing support program uh, primarily provides services to those who've experienced intimate partner violence. And while it has housing in the name, it really is focused on a wide range of practical assistance uh, that can help those who either are in a, an abusive relationship, have left an abusive relationship or been in one in the past and either want to leave or want to stay. So kind of just exploring safety planning and maximizing individual safety, uh, as well as providing access to independent and long-term housing support. So so many individuals who might be staying at Marianne's place are also working with uh, the Transitional Housing Support Program to plan for more independent long-term housing. Our Sexual Assault Center uh, provides therapeutic trauma counseling to those who've experienced any form of sexual violence, uh, such as sexual harassment, sexual assault, and childhood sexual abuse. It's for those who are 16 years of age or older um, who identify as women, and it provides, as well as one-on-one -on -one counseling, the opportunity to connect with other survivors through groups, uh, and also provides advocacy, information, referrals, uh, and works alongside other services in the community, much like many of our services do, such as uh, victim services services is one example. And it can also provide support for friends and families of survivors of sexual violence as well. 
Our Rural Women Support Program is really an amalgamation of services that are available in the Guelph area to be provided in the county, recognizing that there are service gaps for Wellington County. Uh, and so it uh, has, as I mentioned, offices in Fergus, Mount Forest, Palmerston, and Erin. And all of our RWSP uh, workers are counselors, so they provide that one-on-one -on -one support. They run groups. They also provide uh, assistance when it comes to housing, ODSP, uh, applying for things such as the child tax benefit. Uh, so it provides a wide range of practical assistance and connections to services in the county as well as in the Guelph region as well. The Family Court Support Program uh, provides support for those who are in abusive relationship or, or have been in the past who have either already entered the family court system or are thinking about entering. And really it provides that advocacy of someone to walk alongside them to help navigate uh, the paperwork, you know, documenting the history of abuse. Uh, so it is specific to family court support uh, when it comes to uh, custody issues, separation, divorce, et cetera. Uh, but it also can provide assistance with applying for two hour legal aid certificates certificates and preparing for legal appointments and really just having a, a supporter and a cheerleader throughout the family court process. Our anti-human trafficking program uh, provides support to individuals who have or are experiencing human trafficking. Uh, I will say this program has grown a lot in terms of the demand in the past few years, unfortunately, uh, and those services include uh, counseling and crisis intervention, practical assistance, uh, preparing for uh, legal appointments, as well as uh, connections to other support uh, and connections to shelter. Uh, as well, the anti-human trafficking worker alongside myself do a lot of public education. Our 24-hour crisis line uh, is available for anyone to call, so we, we don't take any uh, identifying information, and it can also be for service providers or friends and family members, um, and it provides that immediate emotional support as well as connections to other programs within the agency, so it can kind of act as that intake to the shelter or connections to other program areas. And our public education program uh, is run by me. Uh, so really what that's looking at is seeing education as a really powerful tool in violence prevention and recognizing that this education should be as widely available and accessible as possible. So our workshops are free uh, and available to anyone and they kind of create, you know, three different categories of professional development workshops for workplaces, uh, as well as workshops for youth and that can be done through the school boards or youth programming, uh, as well as broader uh, public workshops that we're doing that are open to anyone. In terms of the themes, uh, these are ones that I often do with youth uh, around self-esteem and body image, healthy relationships, whether romantic or other, uh, consent, talking about sexual orientation and gender identity, gender stereotypes, healthy masculinity, and internet safety. Uh, as well for youth, but also for the community as well. Uh, it's human trafficking education, talking about sexual health, violence against Indigenous women, and bystander intervention are a few there. Uh, these are some that I do for workplaces around professional development of knowing the warning signs, how to respond to disclosures and support survivors, uh, what does it mean to provide trauma-informed care, combating sexual harassment in the workplace, and talking about vicarious trauma. So those are just, again, a range of the opportunities that are available. If you're ever wondering, you know, is this something that Jensen and WIC covers, you can always just send me an email and we can chat about it. And all of the content is delivered to be specific to your audience and age appropriate based on your needs. Um, so why invite us? Like I said, education is key in violence prevention. Uh, it helps gain awareness of what services are available through us, as well as provides opportunities for um, professional development, for volunteers and staff, and for youth engagement. And the workshops that we do as are, are through a trauma-informed social justice and feminist lens. Uh, and other ways that we can support you if you ever want work uh, resources for your workplace about who we are and what we do or posters, uh, anything like that, you can feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and if you are ever have potentially a client or someone that you know who may benefit from accessing our services, you can always reach out to us. Um, right now it's Sexual Assault Prevention Month and we're running a series of workshops. Uh, the next one is tomorrow. It's bystander intervention training it's from 6.30 to 8 online uh, and that can help you provide the skills to be able to interrupt rape culture uh, in your everyday lives. Um, so if you're interested in registering for that, um, the link to register is on our Facebook, on our social media and on our website. Uh, next week, we're also running an event for students uh, specifically, but anyone may be interested as well, uh, which is around how to build cultures of consent. 
and that's next Tuesday the 25th from 6 to 7 30. In terms of referring people to our services, there's multiple ways to connect. As I mentioned, our 24 hour crisis line. We also have our administrative line, which is if you search Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis, that's the number that comes up on Google. Uh, our rural women support program has each uh, office has a different phone number, so you can reach out directly there depending on which area you're in or close to. And all of these numbers are available on our website as well. And if you're interested in reaching out to me and curious about public education opportunities, that's my contact info there. Uh, but I've just thrown a lot at you and spoken really quickly, so uh, I'll give you an opportunity if you have uh, some questions and I can stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jensen. That was a lot of information in a very <laughs> short period of time. <laughs> Does anyone have questions for Jensen? If so, please raise your hand and I'll go in order. Don? Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, how is this funded through the county? This is a good question. We see we receive funding uh, from federal and provincial levels. A lot of our funding comes from the Ministry of the Attorney General uh, and the Ministry of Community and Social Services. So the funding is provincial. Uh, and in terms of our other funding, it comes from independent donors uh, in the community. Okay. One other question, if I may, and that is, uh, you mentioned in the different segments there that um, the number of people that have been helped, like the 24-hour crisis line, you said 3,247 calls. Mm -hmm. Over what period of time would that be? That's from our uh, from January uh, 1st, 2020 to uh, December 31st, 2020. So it's just the no. calendar year through a 12 month period, all yep. of those things where it said 244 people were helped and supported and I yes. see. Yes, One good question, should have mentioned that for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. I also know um, United Way, some of the funding from United Way locally will also go to the Rural Support Women's Program because mm -hmm. With my work, when we ask for United Way donations, that's one of the things that I can say locally where the funding goes. Um, Barb, you're up. Thanks to you, Madam Chair. That was an amazing presentation. Super informative and very, very important, especially timely right now. That number of calls, thanks to Don, uh, I was going to ask something similar. Is that just for, uh, is that for Ontario proper or just for the county or what does that number of calls represent? Mm -hmm. We don't have the statistics of where people are calling from. A lot of the time, just because we don't ask for identifying information, but in terms of the majority of folks who call our crisis line, they're located in the guelph Wellington region. Um, so that could be in the county and in the city of Guelph, looking for either that emotional support or connections to services. Um, and I will say typically over the years, we see an increase in calls pretty much every year in terms of the individuals who are calling our crisis line. So as much as I love where I work and love the work that I do, I also wish in a certain sense that we didn't exist and that the demand for our services didn't keep growing. Um, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions for Jensen? Oh, Christine, you have one. Go ahead. I do. I know that you partner with a lot of um, groups. You're on our leadership table, so you partner with us, uh, as well as with Crime Stoppers. Are there other groups that you uh, partner with, like that you didn't mention in your presentation? Just want to. I just want to let everybody know, kind of the whole goal of of this leadership table and the community safety and well-being plan is that you know we're all working together to uh, make the impact that we we want across Wellington County, surrounding injuries and preventing injuries. Um, mm -hmm. Wellington County. So if you can talk, kind of talk a little bit about, you know, some of your partnerships, that would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So I will say too that like I will partner with absolutely anyone who's interested. Um, and in terms of the partnerships I've done in the last little while, uh, Sarah and I from Crime Stoppers did a great one uh, back in February, I want to say, or March around domestic violence. Um, so it's great to have, you know, multiple service providers co-facilitating presentations and co-delivering educational opportunities. That's definitely an option. In terms of the other partnerships that I have in the community, um, I work with 
organizations such as uh, Shelldale. I'm helping out with one of the Adulting 101 series for the Big Brothers Big Sisters through the Youth Hub uh, with the Integrated Youth Service Network. Those are some other partnerships. I've recently done presentations for um, for some nurses groups in, in Wellington County as well to give that professional development training. So uh, anyone really is, is available to, uh, if you are interested in co-facilitating and having someone from your organization work with me to develop a presentation and, and co-deliver it, that's one option uh, in terms of as well, if you wanna just invite me in, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. But um, yeah, there's really no parameters for who we will partner with. I think a lot of the times individuals will think like, oh, I'm, I don't support survivors or I don't know anyone, so we might not need this. But the reality is, unfortunately, it's so common to experience gender-based violence that it's likely the individuals that you work with, your clients that you're interacting with have had lived experience. So it's important for everyone to have those skills. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Jensen. Uh, Karen, I see your hand up there. Do you go out and do these presentations to councils? Like city councils, do you mean? Yeah. Or? I haven't done one yet, but I would definitely be interested in that opportunity if anyone has uh, connections or would be interested in that. Um, whether that's talking about uh, a policy lens of gender-based violence and what that could look like. Um, well, just, or the just presentation that you just give here was pretty interesting and it would fit in with our our 10 minute presentation time. And I'm a clerk, so I can put the agenda together. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll definitely just, connect after this. Yeah, the press covers these and you know, you get it in the agenda, you get in the minutes. Um, and council really always likes when you come with information and not asking for money. That's really <laughs> what they really like. <laughs> right, Campbell? <laughs> uh, okay, so um, I'll get your contact information after that. Are, and are you going to circulate that presentation to everybody on the call today? Yeah, if I if I can send uh, Angel and Pasquale and Christine, I can send the slides uh, and that can be circulated probably with the minutes if that's helpful. And my contact info is on the slides there as well if you want to reach out. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Jensen. Yeah, I think um, for whoever's presenting, if they wish to add their, just send everything to Christine. And then when Christine sends out our minutes, she can attach the presentations and all the contact information for everyone will be in there. So perfect. Thanks, Jensen. Uh, seeing no further questions, I'm going to thank you for your presentation. And I'm going to call the next person up, which will be Pasquale with the County of Wellington. And I'm just going to duck out for a quick second because my four year old is done pooping. So I will be right back <laughs> and I will let Pasquale present and do what he needs to do because I need to be a mom for a moment. <laughs> uh, thank you, Angel. Uh, it's TMI, I guess, too much information, but that's OK. Uh, thanks for that. So uh, my full time job is uh, I work at the County of Wellington Roads Department. And I help out with the uh, the capital projects uh, and other things as well. So I'm going to share my screen and have a little short presentation. Hopefully it works. Can everybody see that? Good question. Okay, great. So, so I'm just going to quickly go over our uh, 2021 construction projects for for the County Wellington Roads Department, and I'm going to start with our first one uh, here. It's uh, we're replacing a culvert on Wellington Road 16, just north of Wellington Road 109. Uh, this is a culvert that needs a lot of work. Uh, it's currently being held up with jacks, so it's in poor, poor shape. Um, we're going to re be replacing this with a uh, precast concrete culvert. Um, and this will be completed by our county staff. Uh, actually, they we actually complete, um, I think, one or two uh, projects on our own with some help with, uh, with a contractor and we're actually going to install this ourselves. Um, it's actually a quite a cost savings when we do the work ourselves. And uh, actually, our, our roads crews actually really enjoy 
working on these these types of projects. So that's why we keep on doing some work internally. Um, with this uh, project, we would have to actually close the road for a while. Uh, there's a little detour route that will go through Arthur back down line two. Um, it would be uh, about a week uh, of work for us to complete, um, possibly two uh, into the second week, but usually a week, uh, a week and a half would be uh, most times for these types of projects. So it's uh, they're usually pretty quick turnaround. Um, our next uh, project I have on the list here is we're going to be signalizing our two intersections on Wellington 18 uh, on BD Line and Jerry Road intersections. These are right in between a Boeing there from uh, Fergus and the Laura right in between. Um, this has been uh, tendered and uh, we have Cox Construction actually completing these uh, intersections for us this year. So they'll be fully signalized with lights and uh, uh, and the such. So um, actually, Fergus and Laura are, are growing quite rapidly, and uh, we're trying to keep up with development in the area. So making sure everybody's safe on our roads with, with that. Um, our, our next project here I got on the list is uh, we're replacing another bridge, another structure. Um, it's a our Boswick Bridge. It's located. Um, I guess you could say just south of Wellington 26 and in between and in between uh, I think it's right at the fifth line uh, and this is another project that we will have to close the road for and it'll be it started in June July we have to wait for uh, uh, conservation windows to actually work in stream uh, so this would be around a five hundred thousand dollar project um, for, for that so then this will have to be closed and I have a, a little mini detour route here that everybody can see hopefully uh, it would be a uh, detour route on be going down 20, Rolling Road 29 up to 22, then back to Rolling Road 26. So this road would be closed for a short period of time. Uh, I, I believe it would be the same time frame between the two to three weeks as the other culvert that I had showing up on the screen. So um, also on the same road, um, we will be. Uh, We'll be repaving and rehabbing our, our uh, road, Wellington Road 18. I'm not sure if anybody's been dri driven down 18. It's, it's a pretty rough road. So we'll be paving from the uh, Dufferin border all the way down. I believe this time we actually extended the contract to the second line just outside of Fergus. So uh, we'll be uh, uh, recycling the, the asphalt with a cold in place process and placing one lift of asphalt on top of that. So that'd be a nice smooth road uh, in the future here pretty shortly. Uh, I know I drive down 18 quite a bit. It's, it's a pretty rough road and it's time for renewal uh, of that road. It's, it's um, been a long time since the last time it was paved. So um, that's another big project. The, the budget for that was around $2 million to complete that paving project. So it, it won't start until after the uh, Boswick Bridge has been replaced. So it would be I believe late July start for that that project. So another project that we're working on uh, a road re rehab is uh, Wellington 22. So this would be a multi-phase project uh, that we have on on the go. So right now, uh, stage one would be in between uh, Wellington Road 26 up to second line. So this is another road that's so you can see the picture to the to the right there. Uh, it's it's pretty sad, I guess, in shape. It's uh, it's seen better days, and it's this is another road that goes through a lot of wetlands and and the such, and it it's, it does have a, a poor base in it where it, it does uh, structure itself kind of uh, fades away over time. So, uh, willing to road to, I think it'd be a couple of years of, of uh, projects through there of, of, of rehabbing our, our our road through 22 all the way up to 26 in Hillsburg. So, it'd be a uh, um, a big project for us over the next couple of years. So, uh, another uh, paving job that we're we're currently going to look into is um, we're on the road 30 uh, between 39 and 86. This is another road that needs a lot of help. Uh, it's, it's also a tired road that needs some work. So, this is another job that we'll start shortly. Uh, Cox Construction has got this as well. Actually, they, they're doing a lot of work for us this year, and it's it's around. Four hundred fifty thousand dollars to complete that. So that's another road that's going to be new and, and paved. So, yeah. Some structures that we're working on. Uh, I'm not sure if people know where Lake Road is. It's uh, our Wellington 32. It's the southern portion of Puss Lynch. 
Um, this this area is uh, 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 is in between uh, wetlands. It's Pushnitz Lake and uh, and wetland area. So uh, this area it's pretty much flooded <laughs> most of the year. It, it sees a lot of water, and these culverts uh, probably never see dryness in, in general. So uh, we're replacing these with an actual structure. I have a little bit of a drawing here. So we're replacing the culverts that are there with more of a, uh, a pile and a concrete slab structure, um, allowing more water to flow between the two wetlands in the, in the lake in the area. So this road will have to close uh, for a short period of time, I, I believe for a month and a half around. So we do have a detour route for this. There'll be our um, town line road, which is our Wellington Road 33, all the way to 34 and back around to 32. So, uh, and if you're in the area, uh, the old marina uh, is a great place to grab a burger. So they'll be open during that time. So if you're in the Puss Lynch area and looking for a burger, their, their Puss Lynch burger is fantastic. It's, uh, I think it's a half pound of beef with uh, fried uh, uh, cheese. So if you're in the area, drop in, they'll, they'll appreciate the, the business, that's for sure, so. Or there's another uh, structure project that we're going to be completing is our uh, culvert liner on Longmo 32. This is in between Highway 7 and uh, Speed Bell area. Uh, this culvert still has some life in it. The the bottom part of the culvert is rusted out, so we'll be relining this project so we don't have to close down the road. Also, this this culvert is is quite deep, so it'll be quite the excavation to to remove and replace. So. It does have some life in it. We we'll want to keep it for a little while longer, so we'll be relining it. And uh, this road will still be open during that that time. So um, uh, another handful of projects here that we're rehabbing um, three different bridges along Wellington Road 109. Uh, one's of the Maitland Bridge, which is just outside of Harriston. Uh, we'll be rehabbing that project. It's basically uh, installing new walls, uh, carpet walls, uh, new deck uh, surface and clearing out any uh, re uh, re rebar that's rusted out and delaminated concrete uh, deck. So the next one would be the Mallet Bridge, the same thing. It's uh, They're all ongoing right now. And the other bridge is just outside of Arthur there, closer to our, our boundary with the, the Dufferin there. So uh, these are all projects on, ongoing right at the moment. So, uh, and they're moving along quite smoothly, actually, which is great. Uh, another uh, pair of bridges that we're rehabbing, these are actually on a township road. We actually have some bridges that are on township roads that are under the uh, jurisdiction of the county. Uh, these two bridges um, are being rehabbed as, as well. They're just uh, on Jones Baseline area. So what we typically do is with these, these bridges, uh, once we rehab them, we provide them back to the townships for, for their, put them back in their uh, inventory. So. Uh, it's a long story of the background of why we have these bridges, so I won't go into that. If someone really is interested in knowing more, you can always ask and I'll provide more information. So these roads are actually closed on baseline, Jones Baseline. So we have a little detour route here. So you go up side road 10, up 29, and back around to 22 will be your detour route. Um, I know I use Jones Baseline all the time to get to Fergus, and I can't remember how many times I've driven down Jones Baseline hoping to get to Fergus and how to go around the detour route. So even I forget that these projects are on the going. So uh, it's nice. I, I get to stop by and, and see how the progress is on these bridges every time I do that. So uh, another project that's ongoing right now, we're repaving a little section of Wellington 246. Uh, we, this, this, little, this section is needed new pavement. So we're uh, milling off the top portion of the pavement and placing new asphalt down. Also, if you're in on Brock Road on Wellington 246 area, we're still working away at um, in installing a new roundabout at Wellington 34 and, and Brock Road. So that also needs some, is scheduled for some paving this year as well. So there'll be some paving dates out there as well on that section of road. Uh, those are our, our major roads that were, were major projects that we're working on this year. Um, also, uh, this week is our National Public Works Week. Uh, we're celebrating the essential work of County uh, Employee, uh, Engineering Services Department. Um, it's this week from May 16th to 22, and uh, I'm not sure if you can see my mask. I actually have a mask for National Public Works Week, so um, um, we're, we're, we do we. Uh, 
if this wasn't COVID times, uh, we actually would have events going on uh, during the week. Um, I would be uh, helping out with a road, uh, adopt a road program that we would take care of uh, at the county where we clean up the roads. Uh, uh, that's another uh, program that we offer where we have groups, community groups actually pick up litter on the roads and they adopt a section of road. Uh, we help them out with uh, uh, any supplies they need. Uh, we also place signs up for them and uh, on the on the uh, section of road they adopt. So um, that's another great program that we provide at the county here. So um, yeah, so it's National Public Works Week. Uh, there's lots of information on our website if you like to check it out. Uh, there's a there's a link on there, or you just go right to our website, and there I think it shows up on the screen on the uh, if you like to have more information. So that's the end of my slideshow. I'm not sure if anyone has any. Any questions on that? I'll try to answer them as best I can here for you. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pasquale. That was um, fantastic. It's nice to see where the work is being done all over the county. Um, I have a question. When it comes to intersections, um, what is determined or how, if you can explain maybe how it's determined, whether there would be a four-way stop, temporary lights, a roundabout, um, maybe a little bit of that process and how those get determined okay so there is a warranting warrant system for every every uh, item that you selected there so uh uh there's a pro provincial uh book called the ontario traffic manual so there there's different books that help you uh, determine the warrants for a traffic signals uh four-way stops uh it all depends on the traffic in general. So for determining a, a, a uh, intersection that needs signalization, there is movement studies that we complete. And through there, it provides us warrants. So depending on how much traffic the intersection sees, that determines the the, uh, the need for traffic signals, also accidents in the intersection as well. So we compile all that information and it provides us, it spits, we compile that all into a, a spreadsheet of sorts and it spits out the warrants if it's warranted or not so uh for us we prefer roundabouts is our first choice and it really depends on the intersection itself it can if it can uh, facilitate a roundabout uh, then we would actually uh, go ahead and install that uh the intersections on uh, 18 at jerry road and uh, uh and gary jerry jerry and bd line they they don't have the space for uh, a roundabout that's why we're going to traffic in those sections so yeah okay thank you pasquale yeah. um i see christine you have your hand up i do um so in like so i know you're doing a lot of different changes and i noticed a big change i just moved out here to 18 and 26 so thank you all of the construction is in my neighborhood fantastic <laughs> over the summer i guess not all of it but it feels like Big a lot of it there is. yeah, <laughs> yeah. but um we just got a set of lights at 18 and 26 and i know that there is other places throughout the county that have lights um but um they're not going to stay here right like they're they're kind of a, a temporary they're uh, temporary right now that the the intersection warrants some sort of traffic control so I think it's in the I think it's within the five year plan to construct a roundabout in that intersection in general. So it, since it warrants some sort of traffic control, that's why there's temporary lights there currently. So uh, it's more of a safety thing than anything else that makes sure that people operate through the intersection properly. So there's been a handful of really major accidents in that intersection. Uh, a lot of people try to ignore the the stop signs which is sad in a way uh we've tried many different um options to not have to have a traffic temp temporary lights with beacons and four-way flasher over top and those don't seem to actually help people stop so it's it's seemed that more been more prudent to actually install tra temporary traffic signals in that intersection so yeah Exactly. Well, I mean, like I personally, I love that um, you know, you're talking about all the different changes and the infrastructure changes that are happening across Wellington County. And, you know, like 
again, it kind of goes back to the community safety and well-being plan and working together. Now, you know, at public education as well as infrastructure as well as enforcement kind of working together to make our roads safe. Uh, and it's it's fantastic that, uh, you know, kind of we're all working together in order to achieve this. And uh, kudos to uh, you and your you and your team, Pasquale, because you're doing an amazing job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we, we, we do our best. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Pasquale and Christine there. Um, yeah, I did notice the temporary lights over at Parker and uh, the Drake and Palmerston S Bend. So yeah. um, having going through those intersections, I still slow down and look both ways because I don't know if anybody else knows that there's temporary lights there. <laughs> yeah. Well, it takes a bit of time for people to readjust to a change in the environment. That's for sure. So, yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, Sarah has yeah. Yes, I see Sarah Bailey has her hand up, so I'll let you go ahead, Sarah. Hi, Pasquale. Thanks for your uh, presentation. It is good to see what's happening around the county. Um, I have a question from uh, the Pusslage perspective. <laughs> um, a lot of the traffic that comes through that lake road that's going to be closed is from the Cambridge area. So what sort of communication do we give the Cambridge uh, folks about the closure that's going to be in our uh, county? Uh, most times we do advertise placing signs on the uh, construction area itself. We, we provide some sort of two, about two weeks of notice, uh, providing information that the roads will be closed uh, uh, for that project itself. So uh, that's probably most of the extent that we provide information for. So. Okay, so there's not a memo that goes to the city of Cambridge or anything to let their residents know? Uh, not that I know of. We haven't done that in the past. So uh, we do contact emergency services in the area and let them know that it's, it's uh, road closure coming up. So, yeah, so that's the extent that we do for PR. Okay, I just know a lot of the folks in that area are, are concerned about... <laughs> Oh well, yeah, there's there's uh, many uh, uh, concerns about speeding in that stretch of road that we've we've been trying to uh, look into, and uh, our our roadmap has actually looked into that as well. So, um, uh, yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Any other questions for Pasquale? I'll do my last call. Alrighty. Seeing none, um, Pasquale, thank you so much for your presentation and information. It's nice You're to welcome. see what's going on in our county and see how all of that works. Um, if you want to stop sharing, and then I will move oh. on to our next presentation. Okay. Sure. That, yeah. Thank you. All good. Thank you very much. So next up, uh, we have Sergeant Corey Tarortha with the Wellington County OPP, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to try to share my screen with you with a PowerPoint presentation. That would be lovely. Yeah. There we go. Do you have it there? Can you see it? Not yet. You won't see it. Do you see it up there? Not yet. Nope. Let's do that. Can you see it now? Yes, I can. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. I've shared it in lots of things, but not in this platform. So there we go. All right. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to present today. I know I see some of those names. They've heard this presentation before, but um, I'll just jump right in. Um, as a result of the um, decision by the Upper Grand District School Board recently, back in April, um, as a result of their decisions coming out of their police uh, in schools task force, they have uh, decided to remove um, our school resource officers and the program associated with that out of their school system. 
Um, for us in the county, we had four. Um, we actually have five dedicated officers. One will remain uh, doing a partnership with our Wellington Catholic School Boards, but four of them um, essentially have been removed from the schools. And so um, we look to very quickly and decisively switch um, programs and create a new unit out of those four members uh, to best serve the County of Wellington and the youth specifically of Wellington County. So we've uh, come up with a community response unit. Um, and as I said, it's a decision of uh, based as a result of the decision of the upper grant. Um, we feel strongly that we do not need a physical school location. So the bricks and mortar um, of a school in order to engage, educate and interact with the youth or community members of Wellington County. We have lots of opportunities on a daily basis as officers in order to do that. And uh, we believe that it, one of these ways is transitioning, pivoting our school resource officers, our SROs, to a newly created unit and position named Community Response Unit, or CREW for short. Um, it'll provide a lot of flexibility and our ability to engage in community-related uh, safety events and further positions ongoing. So here's a little quick mandate uh, to support established frontline efforts through community response and mobilization, a team that's focused and engaged in year round initiatives, targeted enforcement, support education and partnerships to support and engage youth inclusively and through a lens of diversity and to offer the flexibility and ability to grow with the needs of the community as it continues to change and evolve. This just gives you a quick little timeline, the decision, the confirmation of the decision that came out on April 27th, and then how we kind of plan to progress through into this new unit. Um, we, as I said earlier, have four spots uh, in each of the um, high schools. So that was Norwell, Center Wellington, Aaron District High School, and Mount Forest. And so our process is to pilot two of those spots early July, um, and then we'll pilot the last two in October. Um, there's some strategy there from a policing perspective. Uh, these units would be, these individuals would come into this unit on a three-year engagement, um, a rotational assignment, we call them, an RAA. And so we don't necessarily want all four of those units to, or positions to end at the same time. So that's why we stagger them just a little bit. Um, it'll give us lots of coverage with the two units for summer. And then um, as the next two units come uh, online in October, uh, it'll give us a lot of uh, additional coverage there for festive ride program and some of the events that we hope to see back in the fall. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea and I'll go through some of these as to what these members would specifically be engaged in. Um, so providing countywide frontline support and that looks like they'd still be um, have the ability to attend calls for service. So if um, by chance they were the closest member to a call from a high priority call dispatched out, they would be able to support, um, go to that call for service, be one of the very first units potentially on scene to that. And then as the platoon members started to arrive, they could then sort of fall back and, and provide just supplementary support to that call. Um, engaging uh, our youth specifically. So that's a very large focus of this unit. And that can be done through our youth hubs, um, our uh, different sports associations, local soccer clubs, hockey, uh, lacrosse, that sort of thing. And we're also looking at the creation of a youth advisory council. So the idea behind that is we'd love to, we know that Center Wellington has one, but we'd love to engage the youth of the community. Um, ideally, um, there's, and again, there's still some parameters being put around this, but two youth age 13 to 18 from each of the seven counties to sit on a youth advisory council, um, essentially to get their input, to find out what kind of programming they're looking for, um, ensure that we are being, uh, looking at it through a lens of inclusion, um, including some of those different groups that don't always, um, get noticed. Um, so there's still some, you know, details to follow from that, but uh, that's sort of the basis of that. Um, we'd love to see it, you know, tied into volunteer hours. I know that youth are struggling with that now just with COVID. Um, having them assist in planning some of the youth community events. Um, so it kind of this 
the civilian aspect of it, the civics aspect of it, so to speak. Engage in uh, focus patrols countywide, our members would. So bike patrol, ATV patrol, snow machines, um, ride. I mentioned that already. And uh, this unit would form the basis of our festive ride and potentially of other members um, joining. Uh, to provide targeted support to community concerns. So that um, looks like we consistently have calls for service last year uh, to Bissell Park, kids jumping off the bridge there. Um, Bellwood Bridge, same thing. So some of those targeted areas that at the beginning of season seem to get a lot of calls for service, being able to instill our mem put our members right there um, to help target that specifically. And of course, other community um, concerns as they arose. Lots of uh, foot patrol. So we know downtown closures of Allure and Fergus will happen. We know that Mount Forest and Arthur do some community road closures as well. Um, Aaron Hillsburg, but to, to do some very focused foot patrol in some of those smaller communities. Um, sit on some community committees as required, uh, engage in local events and some media functions and obviously the community events once they come back online. So there's lots of those safe community days, our fall fairs in the fall, parades, Highland Games and Riverfest, um, Tim Hortons Day, all of the ones that we've been involved in in the past, but you'll see these faces, consistent faces um, of this unit. Just a little bit of training. Um, Ideally, one of those members we would love to have as a breath tech for us to support our ride function, bicycle ATV training, snow machine. Um, and again, I mentioned it's a rotational assignment agreement. So three years um, to be involved in the unit. And just a little bit of a summary. So the unit would thrive on flexibility and availability, able to uh, provide frontline support when needed, but focused when not required. Support of the community events provides consistent community engagement all year round. Um, significant support to youth programs throughout the county and uh, the ability to create new programs to be innovative and inclusive. Consistent faces at community events with organizers, operational plans, um, specifically from the county perspective, it's always nice to see the same uh, face faces at some of those events and be able to know that um, that's how those specific officers respond. Um, and then the flexibility of a schedule from an operations standpoint for us. Um, our schedule, just a little bit, it's, it would be very different than frontline, um, where we have platoons that work uh, a specific rotation. This would be a rotation, but it would uh, primarily be days and then afternoons. We know from data um, that our calls for service drop a little bit after two o'clock in the morning. So these um, members would work from like two to two. So we would get the busy afternoons, the busy early part of the evenings, um, and specifically a lot on uh, latter part of the week and weekends. So we believe that this unit will have lots of room for flexibility and uh, an evolution as it becomes established. We believe that this is an ideal way to pivot these resources, rethinking our approach, becoming additionally innovative and progressive in supporting our community members with a focus on our youth. Um, as I said earlier in the presentation, we don't need a building, the bricks and mortar to engage the community or the youth of this county. There's lots of ways in which to do that. And uh, we think that this is an important new direction for uh, Wellington County and um, a great use of the resources that we have available to us. And that is it. I'll open the floor for questions. I'll stop sharing my presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Corey. That was fantastic. Um, will the new officers be the ones that are currently in the schools or will they be needing to apply as well uh, to allow the opportunity for new officers to to join the committee? Yes, yeah, so the um, those previous officers were on a rotational assignment and that rotational assignment kind of outlines their responsibilities. And because it's such a drastic change and alteration, um, those officers essentially were canceled from the program. They returned to frontline operations and they will have the opportunity to apply to this new program as well as all the other officers in the detachment. Fantastic. I look forward to seeing the unit out and about at all of our various events. I will move to the floor. So I'll start with Adrian and then Barb and Sarah Browse. Peter will be up after that. Go ahead, Adrian. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Kari. That was awesome to hear about. I had not heard the presentation before, and it's great. Uh, I mean, it really does sound like a great new redeployment of re resources and moving away from that bricks and mortar process to being much more uh, flexible and how those uh, how those officers can connect with kids, I think is awesome. I just I, I want put my hand up because I wanted in part of the orientation for the crew members. I'm hoping you can include contact for them with the staff at the Rapid Access, Rapid Access Addiction Mobile Clinic and also the Community Health Fan. They're both mobile resources that can have a very low barrier connection for anybody, but particularly for youth. And so, I mean, I, thank you, Christine, you'd send out the infographics. So as we know, the, um, the numbers of youth using substances in the county is increasing. And it's much better if they can have a soft handoff to a health resource rather than criminalizing the response, because usually they're using for all sorts of complicated reasons, most of which have nothing to do with the fact that the drug they're using is illegal. So I would really, and often it's that soft connection between an officer and a health provider and the youth that can be really helpful in making an easy way for the youth to get into getting some help rather than getting uh, criminalized, uh, criminalized for the process they're in. So um, I just, if you don't have those connections, I'd love to forward them to you. Uh, we'd really love to see those officers knowing, like in a personal way, some of the people who are delivering that service. I'd love them to see the vans, meet the meet the staff, and just so they feel confident and comfortable if they are ever linking youth to those services. So just uh, thank you. I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Barb, I will allow you up next. Thanks to you, Madam Chair. I just really want to say thank you um, and to remind you that that decision was not an easy one. Um, but I love what you're doing with, uh, to Adrian's point, redeploying them into uh, out of bricks and mortar and into such a high profile thing. I personally love uh, when I see police patrolling on foot and to hear that you guys are doing that in the closed down space gives me reason to celebrate on many levels. So thank you to you and yours. Thank you, Barb. Uh, Sarah, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have actually been asked about this uh, with regards to Crime Stoppers presentations, and uh, Sergeant Trowartha can obviously um, <laughs> tell me that I'm wrong. But as Crime Stoppers is not a police organization, we will continue to offer presentations uh, through Upper Grand District School Board. We've not been advised by Upper Grand that we are not able to. Uh, attend uh, well, when we're allowed to attend or to present our content. So just to, to clarify that, like I say, unless uh, Sergeant Tawartha understands otherwise, my understanding is that we are able to continue and are certainly going to be pursuing that uh, in person more so uh, once uh, public health allows. Yes, I can speak to that. The recommendation was to remove the officers from the school. There's seven separate recommendations uh, in regards to um, the report. And one of them was obviously to continue presentations within the school. Um, yes, Crime Stoppers would be one of those presentations that uh, would still continue on. What it looks like from a policing perspective and police presenting in schools, we'll still, we're still trying to work out those details of, of um, the parameters of that uh, moving forward. Um, we're still in the new stages of it all filtering its way out. So um, there's still lots of work to be done there. And uh, we still have a partnership with the Upper Grand. What that looks like moving forward, it's in creation, so to speak. So, Thank you, Corey. I'm sad to see the officers go, but uh, hopefully the new response will be able to still incorporate what is necessary and keep our kids on track. If there's no other questions, um, then I'll say thank you to Corey. Oh, Sarah Bailey, you have a question. <laughs> Hi, just one question. I really loved hearing about the Youth Advisory um, Council that could be up and coming and just wanted to make sure that our kiddos in the area um, know about it. What Can you talk a little bit about how you see that kind of rolling out in terms of communication or... 
Yeah, so we've, thank you for the question. Uh, we have had some very preliminary discussions in regards to that. We have like a very good conceptual idea. It'll be one of the very first things with this unit starting in uh, July. Um, July 11th will be hopefully the first few shifts for these members. Um, we want whoever those two, two first individuals are, we want them to be part of the process. So that'll be one of the very first projects out of the gate. We suspect that the Youth Advisory Council will come online fairly quickly, but in September, uh, coinciding with the school year, the start of the school year, um, and whether it is potentially a combination of an application process um, through the schools or whether it's a um, a recommend like a, a recommendation process from community members, somebody that they may know in the community that can you know forward their information. Um, if we got lots of applications, that would be fantastic. Um, and you know, having to essentially pick and choose, like pick um, based on qualifications or um, based on uh, civic interest um, from the get go, that would be fantastic. So we haven't really quite ironed out all of those details. Um, but it is one of the very first projects, Sarah, that we're going to um, put online. Um, that project and the other project is a, it is called Rank Smart. Uh, it's a new program with the OPP um, that is like essentially the old bike rodeos. Um, but the program itself, um, we actually show up with a trailer full of bikes. And uh, it's a four to five hour course, and we're hoping to try to get that through each of the like the seven townships. So that's the other project that'll likely, hopefully, come online pretty quickly. Um, the problem with old bike rodeos is if you had a bike, it was great, you got to attend. But we know that there's some members of our community that aren't that fortunate, and uh, so in order to be inclusive to everybody, we show up with the bikes, we show up with the course, uh, we show up with the instructors, and uh, it's a great day. The kids just literally show up to there. So that's another one we'd love to get uh, to get on board pretty quickly. And, um, you know, maybe some community partnerships for uh, providing, you know, food, that sort of thing. Thanks, Corey. Um, I'll just say in regards to that, I know, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of Minto Safe Communities. Uh, I'll bring my committee on board here. Um, when you decide to come to Minto, and because I live in Mapleton, I can assist there as well. Um, I, I'm sure we would love to absolutely partner and be a part of those days and have our committees out there to assist. Um, if it's coffee and you know, juice and donuts, whatever, we'll, uh, we'll be there. But bike rodeos is definitely one of the things we like to do as a committee. So um, if we can partner and absolutely uh, make a day of it, I know we'll definitely be a part of that. And Dawn, I see your hand up there. I couldn't get my hand up fast enough. <laughs> Because uh, just to um, emphasize what uh, Angel has said, it's a it's a very important part of our program. As in, uh, in our next meeting, which is on uh, the end of the month, we're going to be talking about some type of a uh, uh, bike rodeo, whether it's virtual or or what. So yes, we definitely will be uh, very very interested in having it up to uh, to Minto. <laughs> Thanks, Don. I beat you to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I get for being chair. <laughs> well, thank you, Corey. Uh, sounds like this new committee is going to be fantastic and I look forward, um, I'm sure as well as the rest of our partners, look forward to seeing our units out and about and uh, engaging our youth. Um, so I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on, uh, we have our last presentation for the uh, morning, and I will leave it to Christine to present uh, with Safe Communities Wellington County, and then I will open the floor up for questions afterwards. Christine, you have 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Angel. Um, so I'll be talking about the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan for, for Wellington County, and uh, so, so, it's done, it's it's finished. <laughs> we have, um, so I, I wanna thank everyone on this table. I wanna thank all of our partner organizations. I wanna thank the Wellington County OPP, as well as the County of Wellington, 
and everyone that contributed to this final plan uh, because it has finally come to fruition. <laughs> so I'm going to just share my screen. There we go. OK, so good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to finally show you the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. It has been a very long journey, which started back with the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services as early as 2012. Actually, around the same time, we were creating this very leadership table. Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> The Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services finally landed on a decision requiring each municipality, city, region in Ontario to create a community safety and well-being plan. Funny thing is, here in Wellington County, it started with a napkin that Inspector Lawson wrote on to create the framework and process for this plan, like four years ago. We have definitely had a number of obstacles during this time specific to COVID, uh, but we have completed the plan in style before the July 2021 deadline. Now that the plan has been created, it will be a living document that will be changing, ever changing. Consider this phase one. We will be presenting the plan to all the municipalities following this leadership table. We have already, re already received approval from both the Wellington County Police Services Board and Wellington County Council. With each added year, we will be incorporating even more details and plans that will be created by the extraordinary work that we, our partner organizations and municipalities will be accomplishing, making a greater impact on safety and wellness across Wellington County. There we go. Going forward, we will be focusing our efforts using the four levels of intervention, social development, prevention, risk intervention, and emergency response. Our goal is to remain in the outer two rings of social development and prevention, pretty much what we have been doing for the last seven years. Without further ado, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan for Wellington County. We are all in this together. So I'm just going to share my other screen here. I'm going to zoom back. Because we went through this with the executive. Is everybody able to see? It's up there, Christine. It's up? OK, cool. Yeah. Awesome. So as you can see, like, so I will be providing this to you electronically. Uh, we, we, um, so it has been, as I mentioned in my uh, initial introduction, um, it has been a long time going and we have worked with uh, a variety of different partners to bring this to fruition. So, you know, uh, the initial part of the plan has messages from our uh, our warden, as well as our police services board chair, uh, Joanne Rajuj, and of course my inspector Paul Richardson and myself. So the great thing about this plan is that, again, we're taking the framework that we have here for uh, from the leadership table, from our safe communities leadership table and implementing it for the mandated plan. That's kind of what the Ministry of Correctional Services requested. And we were fortunate enough to already have the skeleton, the framework already in place. So I know that I, I mentioned about the four the four level, the, four, the framework that we're working off of. And interestingly, we have always worked in those outer two rings. So here's that, like, so what I was just talking about. So we've always remained for Safe Communities Wellington County. 
we've remained in the outer two rings of social development and prevention. And we're still going to try and make sure that we stay on those outer two rings. Obviously, there are there, there are situations and programs that will escalate to the point where um, you we will have to utilize emergency response, but we want to make sure that we work together in order to stay in those outer two rings of social development and prevention. So we've used all, so back in 2018, when we did our priority setting exercise, we pulled data from public health and from a variety of different databases, uh, utilizing the 2010 to the 2015 statistics. Well, I realize that these statistics now are a little bit older, but it does show the trends um, going forward, fortunately, right? So, and as we said, this is a working document and we will be changing these uh, statistics and updating them so that we know what areas to focus on. So, for example, um, initially, like, so, so 15,927 days spent in the hospitals due to fall related injuries. That is a huge huge amount of days and so that's why we are focusing on falls in the older population for our um, uh, and, and why we have an action group as well as 638 potential years of life lost to intentional self-harm between 2010 and 2015 so I just need to, you need to keep in mind that this is over a five-year period it's not just for one year and this is Wellington County statistics so that is why intentional self-harm has become it is number three on our list because of the amount of potential years of life lost it's not that we have um, as many injuries um, like the falls but because of the amount of years lost life lost that we focus so much on intentional self-harm <clears throat> And we also have a variety of different statistics that we were able to pull that were a little bit more recent, including the victim services calls, as well as um, the officer hours, the 2,787 and a half officer hours related to mental health occurrences in 2020. So you can see the variety of different um, statistics that we have that um, are more up to date as well. So I'm, not, I'm just gonna scan across because you can all read this. <laughs> <laughs> word for word um, after I provide this to you. We also will be printing, we are printing 500 uh, hard copies of this. Uh, so you will be able to uh, provide me with some numbers and uh, you can, I will be able to drop off uh, hard copies to your organizations. So keep that in mind at the end of the presentation or right now you can email me and say, hey, I want 25, I want 50 uh, uh, copies of the, the plan once it's available. So the one thing that I'm so, I, I love this organization, I love this leadership table because of all the partnerships and organizations that we work with. So this is only um, uh, the, this is like, so the next page here really shows us how many organizations um, are part of the leadership table. And this is actually not even the whole of the leadership table. This is just the, the community scan that I performed back in 2018. And I utilized and I kind of looked at all these different organizations um, who happen to sit on our leadership table on uh, what kinds of um, uh, services they're providing, what kinds of events, what kinds of what kind of um, like uh, different things that they are doing that that we can partner with that we don't have to necessarily uh, reinvent the wheel so so it's just amazing to see how many organizations we truly work with so look at this <laughs> i just think it's amazing and so most of you were around during the priority setting exercise and so you know the different like so what how we came about and how we determined our priorities uh, for safe communities wellington county so we we took qualitative uh, data as well as quantitative data we had our priority setting exercise so there was a lot of a lot of moving parts when we were deciding uh, what kind of uh, what our priorities would be for the next five years and we kind of do that like we kind of we start the process 
within three to five years after each priority setting exercise. So right now, so even though we did our priority setting exercise in 2018, this is the time where we will start actually looking at different statistics and start ramping up to actually have the priority setting exercise once again. So as you can see here in our last priority setting exercise, number one, motor vehicle collisions, number two, falls, number three, intentional self-harm, and four, accidental poisonings. And interestingly, um, interestingly enough, like um, the amount of accidental poisonings that 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 we uh, that have occurred over the like over the over Wellington County um, in the 2010 to 2015. They were actually, it was actually in the position of sixth place, fifth and sixth place, in between fifth and sixth place. But because of the qualitative data and the um, the amount of people who were passionate about um, how we do need to uh, prevent these injuries from happening, it actually got bumped up. So, so although quantitative data is so important to the work that we're doing, we also have to keep in mind that we need the input from from the greater public as well as professionals in the field. And so that's how accidental poisonings actually bumped up. And who knows what's going to happen when we start looking at the new data and speaking with the public and speaking with professionals. It'll be interesting to see what might be moving around potentially. So I want to move on to a lot of the different. OK, so the next few pages are about more of the administrative process, what the leadership table is all about, which is basically what like you can read over those pages. It's the, it's it's the it's the administrative like the um, I guess the nuts and bolts of the leadership table, but what I want to get to before my ten minutes is up is the um, moving forward. What are we going to be doing moving forward, and also highlight the different um, programs that we have in place already, and and we've just begun. So this is. This is just the beginning. So this is, these are the last two things that I like to discuss. And then you can ask any questions afterwards. So as I keep on moving, it's, it's quite a lengthy document. <laughs> so our preliminary issues for attention. So we want to reduce the motor vehicle, motor vehicle collisions throughout Wellington County. So, you know, it talks about the different statistics and especially during COVID, we have noticed that there has been an up that there, there has been an increase of aggressive aggressive and distracted driving throughout the county. Reduced instances of falls in the older population. We already have that action group, same with the motor vehicle collisions. And then and then we also have the um, intentional self-harm action group. And so those are our top three priorities. And so that's why we do have those action groups. And look at this, we have number four, accidental poisonings. We've actually, we've just started a new action group uh, for accidental poisonings so that we can make a, a huge impact on the um, reduction of injuries across Wellington County for accidental poisonings. And so our goal is to partner as well as, and if we need to uh, start action groups for these uh, for the next five, six, and seven, coordinate efforts with all seven municipalities to create an action plan to improve the safety of vulnerable road users, cyclists, and pedestrians. I know that there are certain municipalities that are already doing this, but we want to do a collective approach as well, and maybe we can all start working together. So it does that we don't necessarily need an action group for this, but we definitely need to work together and or instead of staying in our silos in our own municipalities, we need to work together in order to achieve this and make sure that we keep our vulnerable road users safe. Increased safety protocols within organized sport organizations, although it is number six. It is actually, so when you look at the quantitative data for organized sport organizations, um, it actually, because of the amount of injuries that occur, it is it, like quantitatively, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of injuries and a lot of emergency room visits occur for sports organizations and for for sports related injuries. So it's up there, but they're not, they're fortunately not, um, 
there there aren't very many deaths associated with or like with these. It's primarily kind of broken ankles, a variety of different things. So it's kind of lower on the scale, but the numbers are still there. We still have to, have to recognize that that sports related injuries, including concussions, um, are crucial, and we need to make sure that we focus on that as well. And then finally, coordinate efforts to reduce agriculture related injuries. Now, uh, same thing, working with the um, uh, Farm and Home Safety Association, uh, as well as the um, Wellington County Federation of Agriculture, making sure that we are uh, providing the information out there to raise awareness and to decrease the amount of uh, injuries that occur on farmland. And that ties into ATV safety that we are actually talking about throughout the county right now. So right now, okay, so I'm going to quickly wrap this up. But, um, but we are already doing some amazing, extraordinary things throughout Wellington County that I needed to highlight and that we put in this plan um, and uh, under the certain level. So under social development, the Guelph and Wellington Task Force for Poverty Elimination. Amazing. So I couldn't like, so even though we have so many different organizations and initiatives that are already in place, um, this would have been a hundred page document because Wellington County is like so far beyond everybody in in what what we've been doing. Um, that's why I have to say thank you to everybody that's sitting on this table. You are all doing an amazing job. Uh, some things are not in here right now, but they will be. They will be placed in here. It is, as I said, it is a working document. It's a live document that will be ever changing and we'll be adding a ton of different information into it. So. Um, and then prevention, Project Lifesaver, amazing work that Wellington County OPP is doing. Um, community paramedicine remote patient monitoring. The great thing is that we're not staying in our silos. We have the paramedicine remote patient monitoring, but we know that the Falls Action Group is partnering with the paramedicine program um, in certain places here in Wellington County. So we're already working together uh, in order to achieve like uh, prevent injuries across Wellington County. The Canadian Mental Health Association of Waterloo Wellington, their youth type, their, their youth talk um, program, as well as the Here for Hope and their post-prevention resources. Risk intervention, Seniors at Risk Community Response Network of Guelph Wellington. Um, again, emergency response, integrated mobile police and crisis team, the impact team, the partnership between CMHA and Wellington County P OPP is extraordinary and it keeps on like every single year they keep on increasing and the funding uh, there's more money going into it because it's a proven and amazing program that works exceptionally well with police officers and the uh and the um and cmha working together so i just wanted to highlight those and that's the end so um i touched on a few highlights but uh, you can look at this this uh, the plan in its entirety once I send it when I once I send it to you electronically and again please make sure that you send me an email to let me know how many hard copies you would like for your organization thank you thanks Christine uh, I know we've been over this quite a lot for the last couple of years but thankfully we are complete it's live Yay. Um, and I know a copy of it will be going um, on our website, uh, so that'll be nice. I will open up the floor for questions. If anybody has any that they haven't asked over the last like three years. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I guess we have no questions for you, Christine. Thank you for that. Oh, Sarah Bailey has one. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> just, just, it's becoming more of my standard question, I guess, but how are we sharing this with the community at large? What, what suggestions, what are your thoughts on how to get this to everybody's household <laughs> so, so that they know it exists? Yeah, well, well, so through this leadership table, 
Um, so that's number one, because I have now told you about the leader. I have told you about the community safety and well-being plan, and and now it's your jobs to make sure that you send it out electronically, on and and share it on social media as well. We are doing more of a formal uh, social media campaign as well, media campaign uh, campaign, um, and we have. Um, so we not we don't we not only have the plan, but we are also creating a couple of videos like PSAs about it. So we have a 30 second and a 60 second uh, video PSA surrounding the community safety and well-being plan that will be circulated to all of our media outlets. Um, as well as uh, I'll be talking about it um, on the radio. Um, but the biggest thing is, again, I need all of you to take this information and uh, and distribute it because we, as I said, we have a very robust leadership table with far reaching fingers. <laughs> so I really, really need you to um, to work your magic and 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 take all the information that I will be providing and uh, and send it out to your networks. Um, on top of it, we are going to be launching in the middle of uh, probably the second week of June because I want to we, we are going to be um, doing a campaign for Safe Kids Week the first week of June and I don't want it to get muddled with the messaging with the community safety and well-being plan and vice versa. So we uh, will be launching the first week of June. So June 6th, uh, we'll be launching um, that barring anything that like so. Hopefully everything will be printed and everything will be finished by then and uh, we will be able to launch it. The deadline for the community safety and well-being plan was um, extended to July 2021. Uh, so we are meeting that deadline and um, but but we are OK, so we are very unique in that we already had everything in place. A lot of different cities and um, municipalities didn't have that. So they're in the very beginning stages. Even though they have finished their plan, they don't have the background in front. They don't have the background that we have. They don't have the action groups that are already in place. They don't have the framework. They're just putting it in place right now. So we're like light years ahead of everybody. And Wellington County is an amazing, amazing county. Um, we are all doing amazing. I, 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 I can't. I, over the course of these two, three years of two years of putting this together, I have been so enthralled and so proud of the amazing work that all of you are doing in all of your different organization or organizations and municipalities that I'm so happy to be part of this. And uh, it made it so much so easy for me to put this together because I'm so proud of all of you. Thanks, Chris. I think that answered your question, didn't it, Sarah? <laughs> Basically, In a roundabout it's, way. <laughs> Basically, it's up to us in our organizations, uh, whoever we work for, word of mouth to get it out there. Uh, we will be doing social media campaigns as well as radio and print. Um, I believe we'll be doing a uh, photo op uh, with an actual launch in the newspaper. Um, plus it'll be on our website and again, it'll be a live document. So it'll be continuously changing and it's up to us. That's why we're part of the leadership table. Um, spread it out to your resources and this will be how we get it out, right? Somebody needs to know how can we do this? How can we help? Well, let's open up our community safety well-being plan. Let's see who our community partners are. Let's see who we can get connected and get this going. So I think it's fantastic. Um, and we're gonna, we've set the bar high for everyone else to try and follow. So great work to everyone involved. So thanks, Christine. Moving on in our agenda, um, future meeting dates. So we do have June 16th for our next leadership table. Uh, again, that will be virtual since we're still under pandemic rules. And then we will take our summer off, our first leadership table meeting for to resume will be in September, which we will strongly discuss Safe Kids Day, um, as well as a bit in June, we'll be discussing that as well. Um, and then again, November 17th. There, I'm gonna try and scroll through. Uh, any updates? I'm gonna kind of just run through names that, if they stand out to me. Um, Kathy, you are with, Motor Vehicle Collision Padge, if I remember correctly. 
So if you want to update us on the motor vehicle collision. Sure, I can do that. Uh, let me just, I just wanted to pull up our meeting notes. So we got together on April the 28th and uh, we had a discussion regarding what we were what we wanted to uh, move towards doing. So we decided that with the with all of the changes to the ATV off road vehicle, that's what our discussion really focused on. So uh, we're going to work towards that end on coming up with some form of materials to come across like for the entire county perspective of perhaps where is where you can where you can't in kind of like a like a, the 40,000 foot view not going into deep details as to you can't do this you can do this because we we can't change the legislation but we were hoping just to kind of um, educate operators and perhaps when the time that COVID allows, we will uh, we'll reach out to some other member more uh, organizations and uh, and partner with them, so like some of the ATV clubs, things like that. So uh, that was mostly what our discussion was about. Uh, we are we've all we all took homework home. And uh, we are meeting again on uh, May the 19th, uh, sorry, uh, May the 26th to discuss it further. And uh, so, yeah, so that's where we are. Perfect. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I don't see Helen in our uh, list today, but I do know that they, the Falls Prevention um, has submitted their framework for the year. Uh, Christine, if you want to just touch on that briefly. Yeah, so they've submitted their their framework and their their action plan for the year. So that's actually, you know, we we run on a calendar year. Um, so so we, like with with COVID and every all the restrictions and everything that's been going on, uh, we received the action plan a little bit later than usual, but um, but the, and they will be submitting again in uh, December, January timeframe as well. So um, so very specific information like so right now they are promoting um, uh, exercise to prevent falls across the county that seems to be like well I don't know if you um, have heard about the 50 hours of exercise prevents a fall but that's kind of the research that's showing like so the more exercise you you take part in uh, the less likely you will be falling and ending up in the hospital for an extended period of time. So that's kind of what they're focusing on. And so they have an ad going into the Wellington County Advertiser for tomorrow. And uh, we'll be promoting that um, on social media as well. So just keep an eye out for that. And um, and yeah, so again, share on your on your um, on your on your through your networks um, and uh, talk about it, because these are the things that we need to get out there. Uh, the messages that we need to make sure to uh, so that we prevent injuries across the county. And as you saw in the um, plan that I showed you, falls, it, uh, the amount of falls that happen, not just in Wellington County, it's across Canada. It um, is, is staggering um, and we need to help prevent those injuries from happening. So, and that's, this is the way that we can do it. We can make sure that people are, you know, exercising more. We have the, those checklists that they originally, they're, and they're still distributing them. Uh, they have those checklists that are in the um, family health teams that have give you the opportunity to go through your parents' homes with your parents and determine whether they're at risk for a fall. Um, and then go and talk to their fam uh, their healthcare provider as well, right? So, so these this is this is the this is how our leadership table can um, help get the information out there. And um, and this is how this is the capacity that we have as a leadership table, uh, as a community group, uh, to be able to get that information. And uh, so that's what the falls are. The falls group is doing. They have a variety of different um, actions for the next few months as well. But I wanted to highlight what they have going on right away. So, thanks, Christine. Um, Barb, can I get you to touch on Ishpeg, please? Sure. Um, we are regrouping, actually. 
Um, we have decided that there's some discussion that maybe we should have, although I'm looking at today's presentation and uh, I'll meet with Christine again, but we're having some discussion about whether or not we call ourselves just intentional self-harm when we have embraced suicide and potentially eating disorders as well and drug and alcohol. So we're thinking of changing our name to be more about mental health and well-being and uh, switching up our direction instead of planning our own events, aligning with the countless that exist in our community. So the uh, request for a plan really got us going. So as difficult and as challenging as it may have been, we really appreciate that uh, Christine has given us that guidance so we can potentially switch directions moving forward to be more effective. Perfect, thank you, Barb. I will move on to just briefly, we will touch because I know we're out of time here. Um, I will move on to committee ones. Um, Sarah Bowers Peter, if I can get you maybe to just, if there's any updates with Crime Stoppers. Um, just more of the same. It just seems to be we're, we're doing everything we always did just in, in a remote capacity, uh, partnering with different agencies such as Gulf Wellington Women Crisis, Victim Services, and of course um, our, our main partner, Wellington County OPP. Uh, at this time, we are uh, developing our um, community uh, safety uh, grant with uh, Victim Services and OPP and hoping to have something to report, um, if not the next time, we're together then for sure in the fall. Uh, very excited about that partnership. Uh, and as always, we're still open. And if anyone has any information that they want to uh, report, just let people know that Crime Stoppers is still taking tips safely and anonymously at 1-800-222-TIPS or through our website, www.csgw.tips. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Sarah. Um, Don, I will let you present for Mento on my behalf. I was having trouble with my mute button there. Um, well, we um, we will be having another meeting at the end of the month, and um, part of our discussion will be on this whole idea of um, education with the ATVs, because um, as you know, the town of Minto um, voted to allow them in in uh, Minto, and uh, the challenge, I guess, will be how do we get the word out there is what is allowed and what is not allowed. Um, the other thing is we were, have always been um, uh, advocates of uh, bike rodeos and uh, bike safety. And uh, since we can't do the usual thing this year, uh, the plan is to try to do some virtual thing or something that we can do uh, remotely. Uh, and still offer the kids prizes um, this year. So that's one of the things, that's uh, the things that we're working on right now. Perfect, thank you, Don. Uh, Sarah Bailey, I'll reach out to you. And if there's anything from Puslin at all. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're, st we're still slowly getting going. Um, one of the, things we've decided to do is use the new township engagement platform. We're hoping to kind of have a little project through that where we're um, kind of simulating the questions that um, data collecting uh, just for local local post lunch. So we're, we're waiting to kind of get that program in place and then actually sort of launch <laughs> uh, to the public that we're here and who we are and, and then maybe start to gather a little bit of um, membership. So we're kind of on the cusp of, of getting going. It's just been hard with COVID. So anyway, stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, is there any other updates or thoughts from the floor? If so, if you want to raise your hand and I'll call you in order. A reminder that the first week of June is Save Kids Week. Um, and the theme this year is to get outside. I see you, Christine. Um, is to get outside and get active. 
um, too much screen time going on with our kids, so activities will be planned within all of the areas. And go ahead, Christine. Yeah, I just wanted to, I know that there ha there is, um, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot, Will. <laughs> He, he's, he's, he's a new member to our leadership table, and um, I, I just wanted to introduce, well, I wanted him to like maybe int introduce himself and uh, tell us a little bit about um, what he does and what organization he's part of. So, Will, well, take it. <laughs> I can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. I wasn't sure if, uh, if it's working here. So my name is Will Whitley. I'm a director at Family Counseling and Support Services in Guelph, or rather we serve Guelph and Wellington County, as you know, um, for all clinical services, mental health, as well as um, we have a distress line, um, which we acquired back in January 2020 from Old Torchlight. Um, and um, so that has really kicked off. And um, I know I was interested to hear um, um, Jensen's um, piece earlier in terms of the numbers, of course, he's had in the year. We've, we've built ours up, I think, in this past year from around about um, 2,000, which has been previous to us taking over to over 15,000. So we're really um, making a, we're seeing a lot of calls on our distress line. But I also, me personally, I oversee the developmental services side of the agency. So we work with children and adults who have a developmental diagnosis in all of Wellington County um, and support them. With, uh, there's a lot of folks there, of course, with the mental health as well. So um, I'm actually coming on to this committee as part of the developmental services planning table. So I sit on a systems table, which is both Dufferin and Wellington counties. So we have the executive directors and pretty much directors from each of the different developmental organizations who sit on that table. And um, I suggested, because I knew Christine, that it might be an idea for me to come on this table because we're looking for someone to um, sit in the county um, table. And um, I'm a county resident. I live here in uh, Centre Wellington. And um, I just thought it may maybe made sense for me to come and take back that information to my DS planning table. Um, I must admit, I was here today to find out where the safe committees, um, the safety in the community piece was at. Um, and so I was, uh, um, Christine, I'm presently surprised and shocked when you said it's done. <laughs> so the community and safety and well-being, and which, is, which is fantastic. I'm, I'm thrilled that you've, you've obviously spent a lot of time, many amount of years as a committee to do that. So um, I'll be taking that back and I'll ask for a couple of hard copies, but if we're getting a um, electronic copy that's awesome but generally we support you know folks in the county with um with mental health and the developmental side of things so there's an awful lot of irons in the fire which um you've asked us maybe some updates i can't give a couple of them but i'm excited for a couple of things that we have coming up for our youth um in fact the one piece has been mentioned i think we've got a, we're going to be setting up some supports for the lgbtq um, community and youth specific um, and I'll have some other thoughts about how maybe I can use our distress line in that as well um, as physical um, space in the youth hub. And we have our offices in the Fergus next door to the Beehive as well. Um, and what's the other piece? Oh, yeah, just um, because we've got a big, a big change happening with our agency in the next couple of weeks. Um, so I know this is not so much a systems piece and one, one little part, but our, our agency is finally, um, we're having a rebrand and our name, we're going to have a new name beginning of June. I can't mention it now because our, our team, my team don't know, um, but we're, it's going to be advertised probably in, in the next week or so, 10 days, we're going to be doing a fairly big um, um, uh, advertising campaign to support um, for folks to realize who we are. Um, and there's, of course, with that new brand. Um, but we serve folks, of course, up in Minto, um, or uh, Palmerston, Harriston, Mount Forest, um, Puslins, um, and the Guelph. So we, we, we serve um, a great many people. Um, significantly with those mental health, those developmental pieces. So generally, that's where I come from. I was trying to keep it really short because I recognize the time. Thanks, good. Christine. Thank you, Will, and welcome to our table. All right. Is there any other updates or thoughts? Seeing no hands. I will say thank you to everyone for being a part of today. Thank you to everyone who presented. Um, greatly appreciated. I absolutely love learning about everyone who sits around this table and what we all bring. Um, so thank you. So I will say good day to everybody and we will see you all on June the 16th. Thank you everybody. Enjoy the sunshine. Yes. Have a great day everyone.